and the parents who got them there. Because believe me, it's like dragging a plow through mud some days. What, that didn't get an amen? Oh well. <clears throat> Would you stand and join? These are the days of Though these are days of great trials, the famine and darkness and swords, to we are the voice in the desert, crying, prepare the way of the Lord. Behold, He comes, riding on the clouds, shining like the sun, as the trumpet calls. I can see the rising sun. I can see the 
song, believe it or not, is not about running into people that you know, but it's about seeing God in all things and in all places. And so would you turn to one another and say, I see the Christ in you. If you are a graduate, uh, if you are graduating this year, please uh, come on up front here. We, uh, we want to call up all our students who are graduating. Uh, but up, up, uh, while they're coming up, if uh, you would grab your worship folder and take a look. Now, I know there's students graduating in this service. Where are you? And they're like, oh, maybe. I saw Garrett this morning. Where's he? Come on down, come down, come down. <laughs> down, children, down. Right up here, right up here. Don't worry, Crystal, Crystal, take care of you. See, we're calling them forward. Are there more up there? I can't see you. We're good? We only got two. So there's lots of stuff in your worship folder, lots of announcements. Check these out. Take this home. Read it to yourself. I'm not going to read it to you. Um, but pull out your communication card. Fill this out. This is one of the ways we take attendance. You can sign up for stuff on the back. Uh, you can sign up for uh, Power of Momentum Group, for Sierra Leone, and for, I'm writing backwards. Oh, picnic. Huh. There's a picnic. My last Sunday here, uh, June 24th. I know, it's coming. I'm coping. Uh, 8 o'clock is traditional. 9.30 is celebration, and at 11, there is no service. We're going to do a picnic-style lunch, so you're, you're invited back. So sign up for all those things on the communication card. Put this in the offering basket after the message, and then the yellow prayer cards in the pew backs in front of you. Take a moment, fill these out so that we can be in prayer with you. And I mentioned earlier, if you want to receive the prayer requests and you don't currently, sign up on your communication card. Like mentioned, I want to be on the prayer team, and they'll send them to you every time that we have those prayers. So uh, we sent out a lot of prayers this week via email. There were just a lot of things going on. So sign up for all of that. Now, these two students who are here, hi, y'all. Look, you're holding it so neatly. There's even a picture of you there. Whoa. How old is this picture? Oh, seven. Dude. <laughs> See, parents, you're doing that right now, aren't you? I still got the red hair. You still got the red hair. Didn't lose it. Good job. We're so proud of you. 
So uh, between Garrett and Sarah, they have both received um, a card from Crystal and our student ministry just telling them how much they mean to us. And they're both receiving a blanket. May I steal this for a second? There. I'll give it back. I promise. Um, it's a nice fleece blanket, whether they're going to school, they're going uh, to work, whatever they're doing. And on it is embroidered, nothing can ever separate us. It's taken from Romans 8.38, where Paul reminds us that nothing can ever separate us from the love of God as found in Christ Jesus. And likewise, nothing is going to ever separate you guys uh, as our students, as Trinity family, no matter where you go. Whether it's to college or halfway around the world, you are still part of this family. This is your home, and you are always welcome and loved here. And so this morning, I want to pray over them. I want to invite you to extend arm because it's kind of like we're commissioning them, right? They're, they're not only graduating, they're not only going on to something new in life, but we are sending them out into the world uh, to be the hands and feet of Jesus. And so we extend a hand, a gracious and amazing God, set forth your spirit upon Garrett and Sarah. Lord, you are calling them to great things. You have raised them to be mighty men and women of God. You have raised them to transform this world, to bring hope to the hopeless and light to the darkness. We pray, Lord, that you will reassure them. Be the light and the hope in their lives when uh, life gets stressful, because Lord knows that happens uh, through college and transitions, through work and community. Lord, bless all that they do and let them know that they are never alone, for you are always with them. And we are always here for them. We ask this in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. amen. Will you applaud their accomplishment? <laughs> We're going to return into worship. Uh, you can stay seated for this next song. Uh, Matt?
haven't picked up on a theme this morning, it's all about kids. And we as the children of God, let us bow our hearts and our heads before our Father God. Let us pray. Gracious Lord, Lord, we thank you for all the blessings that you've given us even to this day. We thank you, God, for the students we celebrate this morning who are moving on to the next chapter of their lives. As parents, as friends, as family, it's difficult to go through transitions, but we are excited for them. We know that something new, that something hopeful and something promising awaits them, and uh, we look forward with anticipation to the future. And God, for the bulk of us here this morning, who don't find ourselves in a place of change or transition, but we're just grinding along, we look forward to a future with you. We look forward to your spirit dwelling in us every day, and and we ask for that spirit to bring us peace and comfort, because sometimes, Lord, (laughs) the monotony can seem overwhelming. Sometimes the routine of the regular, well, it can get frustrating. So we ask you for the healings that we seek. We ask you for the blessings that we need. And we know, God, that you deliver. We turn to you in sure confidence confidence that you have taught and that your disciples have passed on, confidence in the name of Jesus. And we pray today in the words that he taught us to say, praying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. This morning's scripture reading is from the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 11, verses 1 through 7. You must love the Lord your God and always obey his requirements, decrees, regulations, and commands. Keep in mind that I'm not talking now to your children, who have never experienced the discipline of the Lord your God or seen his greatness and his strong hand and powerful arm. They didn't see the miraculous signs and wonders he performed in Egypt against Pharaoh and all his land. They didn't see the Lord, what the Lord did to the armies of Egypt and to the horses and chariots, how he drowned them in the Red Sea as they were chasing you. He destroyed them, and they have not recovered to this very day. Your children didn't see the, the Lord cared for you in the wilderness until you arrived here. He didn't see what he did for Dathan and Abraham, the sons of Eliab, a descendant of Reuben, when the earth opened its mouth in the Israelite camp and swallowed them, along with their households and tents and every living thing that belonged to them. But you have seen the Lord perform all these mighty deeds with your own eyes. This is the word of God for the people of God. So good morning once again. 
At this time, it's appropriate to pull out your teaching notes, which you can find on the front of your worship folder so that you can follow along with the message. All of our graduates that we're celebrating are on the very back if you get bored and just want to go and check out who's graduating. Maybe you know somebody. How cool. Um, but uh, we are starting a new series. It's only a two-week series this week entitled Raising Cain. And uh, it's just a fun one. This actually was requested uh, last year, last April, when I had put out asking, what did you want to learn about? Somebody said, hey, what do I do with my kids in worship? And so, uh, well, how do you raise Cain um, when, when that's part of your life? So I want to start today by starting with a picture. Because a picture is worth a thousand words, right? Uh, this picture, uh, this picture is three years old. This is a picture of my two boys. Uh, Christian is here on the aisle, and Eli is a little bit deeper. This picture is, as I said, three years old. It was taken after we had woken up our boys at about 3.30 in the morning. We piled them into the car. We had luggage in the back, not that they knew that that was there. And we drove to BWI Airport in Baltimore. And we told them that we were going to pick up grandma and granddad, that they were flying in, you know, because they live in Maryland. <laughs> and that we were going to pick them up. And I'm glad they didn't think about this because we only had a four-seater vehicle at the time. Uh, <laughs> And so we got to the airport, and we opened up the back hatch, and we handed them their Disney wristbands. And about six or seven hours later, this is the two of them on the Disney Magic Express, absolutely pooped on their way to the hotel. It was great. And they were so excited. And we as parents were really excited. You know, we knew at the time that there was a transition coming up. We knew we were coming here. And so we wanted to take them and get them to try it. At the time, Christian was four and Eli was nine. And they had never in their own right experienced, you know, the Epcot geosphere right? They had never stood there and looked up at the geosphere in the beautiful colors that happen at night as the sun sets. They had never been inside to ride it up and down and, and see all that's in there. They had never been to MGM Studios and ridden Tower of Terror, which worked out really well because I could get them on it. The doors opened and we fell and I was the dad of the year. Anyway... <laughs> Right? Tower of Terror, it was wonderful. They'd never been there. They'd never seen it for themselves. They had never seen the magic of Disney at night, right? When it's all lit up and you've got the Magic Kingdom lit up and the light parade and the fireworks and the fountains and the story that Disney tells. Going to Disney is a truly magical experience that you can't just tell somebody about. I mean, telling is great, but you have to experience it for yourself. And, and you can't just think that your kids know what it's all about, right? If you've ever been the kid to go, it, there is something wholly different when you experience it firsthand. And as parents, as parents, we wanted to take them. We wanted them to experience that joy, that magic for themselves. And you know what? The same, brothers and sisters, is true of where you are right now. The same is God's desire for your children when it comes to a relationship with him. God wants us to experience the magic, the transcendence, the joy, the divine and human interaction that happens when we come to him. And it's not the kind of thing, it's not the kind of thing that you can just think you know. You have to hear it. You have to see it. You have to taste it. You have to experience it. And in Deuteronomy chapter 11, Moses is teaching the people of God. He is telling them very clearly. In fact, he is making it part of the law that you pass this on to your children. Take them. Let them know. In the whole entire book of Deuteronomy, Moses is trying to ensure that God's people stay God's people. He, he builds all of these laws into it. God lays them out, all of these eating laws and these dressing laws and these talking laws and, and all of these cleanliness laws, and it's crazy. But every single law is about passing on the faith and ensuring that the next generation stays God's people. That's the whole intent of every chapter in the book of Deuteronomy. And here in chapter 11, Moses 
Moses speaks to the people and he says, very clearly, you must love the Lord your God and always obey his requirements, decrees, regulations, and commands. Keep in mind that I'm not talking to your children. Moses says, I know, I know that you think this applies to everybody, and it does, but I'm not giving this command. I'm not putting the pressure of the law on your kids, and here's why. They didn't see. They didn't see the miraculous signs and wonders he performed. They didn't see what the Lord did to the armies of Egypt. They weren't there. You see, at the time, walking around in the desert of Israel, in the desert before they entered the promised land, they're there for 40 years. And in the course of 40 years, there are some children who have been born in the wilderness. Children who had never seen the pyramids outside of Memphis. Children who had never stomped out mud bricks who had never been under the lash of a slave driver, children who didn't know the sounds of the cries of the firstborn children being taken away from Egypt, children who had not been chased by Pharaoh's army to the brink of the Red Sea and then to cross over on dry land when there had just been water before them. The children didn't get to experience that joy and celebration as Egypt brought out all of their gold and all of their blessings to give to the nation of Israel as they were exiting. Moses speaks to the people and he says, look, look, there's kids among you who didn't see what you saw. They've never experienced the Disney magic. You got to tell them about it. Okay, if you're going to complete the law, if you're going to fulfill God's desire and command, if you're going to keep them God's nation, you got to tell them who they are. And I'm not putting the pressure on them. I'm putting the pressure on you, parents, says God. Because they didn't see. It's just that simple. They didn't see. Now, we know what our kids have and have not seen, don't we? We know when they've been to Disney. We know when they have seen the grandioseness of the Grand Canyon. We know when they've stood and stared up at the great redwood forest of the Pacific Northwest. We know when they have stood at the base of the, Par uh, of the Eiffel Tower in Paris. We know when they have been in the French Quarter in New Orleans, probably in college. We know, we know what our kids have and have not seen. But do we ever stop to think about that when it comes to worship? When it comes to experiencing our God, or do we assume, do we assume that they've seen? Do we assume that they've picked it up? You see, God speaks through Moses to say that we can't assume. We've got to make sure that we're passing this on. Because the power of our faith experience, it is incredibly important to our children. Taking our children to church is not the same as teaching our children to worship at church. Do you understand the difference? You see, I remember as a child, I adored Pastor Jody Link, and we were there every Sunday, and I was the acolyte, and it was kind of cool and fun, but I sat next to two people, my parents, every week, and they taught me how to open a hymnal and how to read the liturgy. They taught me how to worship. You see, that's, brothers and sisters, what we got to do we got to pass on to the next generation. And, and don't get me wrong, Sunday school is incredibly important and incredibly valuable. But we can't rely on Sunday school to be the exclusive influence on our children. Because parents, hear me clearly, you are the number one spiritual influence on your kids. No one will have a more powerful impact on them than you do. For good and for bad. They pick up on what we're doing. They will model us and they will mimic us. They may even rebel against us based on what we've done. And some parents, we, we've used the excuse to say, oh, but I want them to have a choice. And I get that. But they didn't see. We can't give them the choice if we haven't shown them in the first place. We owe that much to them. And God calls us to do that and to speak that hope into them. Because the amazing part of our kids, as much as they didn't see, they are always watching. 
They are always wise. Don't, don't you hate it when your kids first start speaking? You realize what words you actually have been saying? <laughs> that comes back to bite you, doesn't it? Our oldest's first words was boom. <laughs> we realized that he fell a lot on his butt, and to keep him from crying, we would say, oh, boom. And that was his first word. <sighs> Later, his word became actually. Apparently, I actually say actually a whole lot. <laughs> Who actually knew that? They're always watching. And God knows that they're always watching. God designed them to be these little sponges. And this is why earlier in Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy chapter 6, it's the most holy part of the entire Old Testament. You talk to any Jew, you ask them, what's the most important part? They'll say Deuteronomy 6, the Shema. Shema Yisrael. Hear, O Israel. Listen up, Israel. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. Love your neighbor as yourself. And teach these things to your children. When you are lying down and when you are getting up, when you are eating and when you are traveling, when you do your morning devotions and when you read them a Bible story and pray with them at night, teach these things to your children by your example and by your direct instruction. Teach these things to your children. Talk about it at the meals that you have with them, right? We spend six and a half days with our kids outside of the influence of church. Do you realize that? Six and a half days. The church only gets half a day. And to be perfectly honest, for most of us, it's two hours tops. Two hours does not replace the influence that we have as family and parents because they're always watching. I remember quite vividly as a kid, we would have Thanksgiving dinner at my aunt and uncle's house. My aunt and uncle from Delaware, and, and they were great. And my uncle... Every Thanksgiving, he would pray over the meal, and he prayed with such a confidence and such a godly presence that there was no question who ruled that household, and it was not him, it was God. Here, 30 years later, I know that fact that I observed as a child, because they're always, always watching. Now, those of you here this morning who don't have kids, you may be thinking, ah, oh, preacher's not talking to me today. <laughs> Dodge that bullet. Yeah, he is. <laughs> you see, in this passage in verse 6, uh, Moses goes on to talk about these guys, Dathan and Abiram, right? Dathan and Abiram. And he talks about the earth swallowing them whole. And it's kind of like, what's that about? They didn't see that. That's good. Like, I don't know that I'd want my kids to see that. Cover, cover their eyes. Uh, but he's referring to a story in Numbers chapter 16. Numbers chapter 16, some of the people rise up being led by Nathan and Abiram and, and this guy named Korah. And they're challenging Moses' authority to be in charge of the nation of Israel. And they're getting into a little throwdown here. They're having a fight about it. And Moses says, okay, well, look, you bring your incense, I'll bring mine, we'll pray to God. And you know what? The one that God doesn't endorse, maybe the earth will just swallow you up. Like, that's, that's how it'll end. Sure enough, they pray before the Lord, and Nathan and Dotham, uh, Nathan and uh, Do Dathan, Got to get the names right. Dathan and Abiram are swallowed up by the earth. And not only them as parents and leaders, but their entire household, the ones who were and were not helping lead this little rebellion. In fact, the scripture says that 250 leaders and 14,700 other individuals, plus their tents, their properties, and all of their cattle and livestock are swallowed up by the earth and fire whole. The scripture says, as they went down into the earth alive, it consumed them. You see, God, God is calling all of us out as a community. God is calling all of us to say this is everyone's responsibility, not just those of us with children, but every single one who comes in contact with a child, for it takes a village. And as the body of Christ, we are one. We are one community, we are one village, we are one body. When one got kids, we all got kids. Because they have been entrusted to us. Us is a plural word. Us means every single one. They have been entrusted 
to us. And I get it. As a parent, and as a person who does not have direct control over someone else's kids, kids can be challenging. Kids can be a handful, and kids can make noise in worship and be distracting. And yet, no, the, you know the beauty of a child and the reason that I invite people to bring their kids into worship and I don't mind when kids cry or yell especially because I can preach over my own wife I can preach over them right the reason that I'm okay with this is kids bring an innocence and a creativity and a passion and an excitement to worship that no adult can compare we could learn so much from the eyes of a child you see there was a there was a pastor pastor Mike Pastor Mike, he was a slender man, uh, average height, and, and he had dark brown hair and a, a bushy brown beard. And Pastor Mike would process into worship every week, and he'd preach up front, and he'd do the pastor thing, and he'd process out. And Caleb, Caleb was four years old, and he would sit in the back of the sanctuary with Mom, hoping, Mom would, that Caleb wouldn't make too much noise and distract too many people. Uh, but Caleb would look for Pastor Mike to come in every week. And on the one week over the summer when Pastor Mike was away and a substitute filled in, a, a kind gentleman who was a little bit taller, a, a little bit bigger, and a little bit balder, a typical pastor, and, and he came in. <laughs> little four-year-old Caleb asked his mommy, where's Jesus? Because you see, through the eyes of a child, he was Jesus. He was the one that got up and taught us how to love. He was the one that got up and taught us what it is to lead and to love God. He was the one that got us to be our best selves. He was Jesus to this child. Brothers and sisters, whether you realize it or not, there are children who are watching you. You are the mentors. You are the leaders. You are the coaches and the teachers. You are the role models that they are looking up to you. And whether you think it or not, you might be Jesus to one of them because they have been entrusted to us every single one of us and they're watching and their faith their faith grows by our witness by our ability to be that Jesus with skin on by our ability to share our vulnerabilities our questions our doubts and even some of the answers that we've come up with and so I want to invite you church I want to invite you to do that. And you can testify to kids in all different ways. You don't got to lecture to them. You don't got to be the Sunday school teacher. Lord, I hope that my kids have a better role model than me. But there are some things, there are some things that you can do. Because what we know is that kids, kids learn and grow by song. So teach them a, teach them a song. Teach them that song that you learned as a kid, Jesus Loves Me, or one of many others that maybe you learned at camp. Or teach them your favorite hymn. I was recently listening to Harvard Business Review, and they did a study of toddlers and infants. And they took these kids, before they could really communicate, and they would have someone hold the infants, hold the toddlers, and swing with them to music, right? And for half the study, they had them swing with the rhythm and the beat of the music, right? They danced with these kids. And for the other half, they had them dance offbeat. That'd be my group. <sighs> All right, And then what they did was they took the kids and they kind of set them aside and they had the adult who was previously dancing with them grimace and become frustrated over doing something. And the kids with whom they danced on beat empathized with the adults. They hurt with them. They cried with them. They wanted to help fix it for them. The kids who were danced with off beat had no empathy, no connection, and no relation with the adults who expressed the same frustration. What they were able to deduce from this study is that kids, whether they are of age to speak the words or not, they learn, they speak, and they relate through music. It is powerful. 
even at a very young age, before they can read, you have the ability to witness to your faith through the songs in worship that you love, teaching them your favorite choruses, teaching them the old hymns, teaching them whatever it may be that speaks to your heart. And then you can pray with them. And it doesn't have to be the big flashy prayers. It doesn't have to be a godly prayer that you speak in a deep voice and a booming God presence. That'll get you nowhere. Pray with them the honest prayers. My wife has this really cool thing that she's been doing with the kids for as long as we can remember. Whenever an emergency car goes by, a police officer, an ambulance, a fire truck, we can be driving along the road. Okay, what do we do, guys? Stop and pray. And she has them pray for the emergency workers right then and there. God, keep them safe. God, bless the people that they're going to help. Quick, tight, but it puts the presence of prayer and God within a daily context. She's a genius, right? That's... <laughs> this is being recorded for YouTube. You have it for posterity, dear. We have the ability to teach our kids to pray, and that lesson has a lasting influence on them. And then when they come to worship, right? When you do have, you're brave enough to bring the, the screaming antsy child into worship, ask him questions about what happened. Hey, my kid, my, my seven-year-old Christian, he's got cars and activities up there, and he kind of like rolls over the pew pad and kind of crawls underneath. Like, he's all over the place. That's why she's in the balcony. But you ask him after church what I talked about or what else happened, he's right on it, especially if I mentioned his name. They're watching, they're listening, they're right with you. Help them process it, ask them the questions, capitalize on it. Maybe you didn't understand something. Ask them what you didn't understand and learn it through the eyes of a child. And sometimes, maybe sometimes you want to give them the offering. You know, the communication cards and the prayer cards and your offering envelope, hand it to them and let them put it in the offering basket. You think it's fun to do as an adult. Imagine what that's like to a six-year-old, right? That'll mean the world to them. And you're teaching them generosity. You're teaching them participation. You're teaching them what it's like to worship and be in the body of Christ. And speaking of the body, the bread and the juice that we celebrate in Holy Communion, tell them what that's all about. Don't tell them in big theological words. Please don't use the word transubstantiation. That'll just confuse anybody. That confuses seminarians. But just tell them, you know, you know the bread, we, we eat bread all the time, don't we? You know, when we eat bread, we remember Jesus' body, don't we? That, that sticks with us. And when we drink juice, you know, the red grape juice or the purple grape juice, we remember that Jesus died for us, that he gave his life. He, ble he bled for us so that when it comes to be the first Sunday of the month you just do a quick quiz as you're walking into worship so we're going to do communion today what's the bread mean what's the juice mean great and they understand that God's love goes before them and God's love is always available to them see brothers it's not hard it doesn't have to be complicated and Lord knows you don't need to be an expert in this stuff. But we do have an obligation. We do have a duty. Keep in mind that I'm not talking now to your children who have never experienced the discipline of the Lord, your God, or seen his greatness and strong hand and powerful arm. They didn't see. But you have seen. Pass on your vision. Pass on your faith. And transform the world. Amen? Would you pray with me? Amazing and everlasting God. Lord, we thank you for the little ones in our midst. We thank you for the children of all ages who come to celebrate your name. They sing with bright eyes and excitement. And Lord, sometimes it's a battle to get them to church. 
Sometimes it's a battle to roll them out of bed and to get them out the door. As they get older, the struggle might get harder, but Lord, we love them. And it's not only out of a sense of duty as teachers and, and parents, as leaders and mentors, but it is out of a sense of love that we introduce them to who you are. And so we ask you, God, to, to bless us and to guide us, to give us the courage to, to step out. Being a parent, <laughs> there's no handbook. Talking with a kid can be scary sometimes. So God, we ask that you will make us brave and bold. Give us the words to speak and the faith to share. Help us to tell them about what Jesus has done for us and what Jesus is ready to do for them. For it is in Jesus' name that we ask this. All God's people said, amen. This morning as we continue in worship, we turn to offering our tithes, our gifts, and our offerings. Communication cards and prayer requests, I invite you, if there's a kid in your pew, to hand them over to them and let them put it in the basket, right? That's a cool way. Whether they're your kid or not, it doesn't matter. Just don't let them take it out of the sanctuary. Like, whatever. As you give this morning, I invite you to give with a thankful heart.
This morning we have the opportunity to come before the Lord's table, and the Lord's table is open to children of all ages. It's open to anyone who knows the name of Jesus and wants the name of Jesus applied to their life. And so this morning I am joined by Hope, who is going to help me celebrate communion this morning. Communion is a time where we remember the sacrifice that Jesus has made for us where we remember the last night that he was with his disciples as they gathered for a meal in the upper room. When the meal came to a close, Jesus took the bread. He blessed it, and he gave thanks, and he broke it. Giving it to his disciples, he said, This is my body, broken for you. Take and eat. Likewise, when the meal was over, he took the cup, the cup that signified a promise that a Savior, a Redeemer would come. He took that cup and he blessed it and he gave thanks and he gave it to his disciples and he said, this is my blood. It is the new covenant, the new promise. Take and drink and as often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts, through Christ Jesus our Lord, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving. We ask your Holy Spirit to be upon us, to bless us and these gifts of bread and juice. Let them be for us the body and the blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the hands and feet of Christ in mission and ministry. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ one with each other, and one in ministry unto all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at your heavenly banquet. We pray all this through Jesus Christ our Lord, our Deliverer, Redeemer, Savior. This we pray, all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Friends, all things are prepared. If you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, we invite you to come to the nearest corner. I'll dismiss you out the side rows. Servers, come on up now while I'm talking. We invite you to go out the sides as you're dismissed. You'll take the bread. It's broken off for you. You dip it into the juice. And if you're coming out the front, you'll come down across the front and then greet the person across the aisle from you. Wish them the peace of Christ, give them a handshake, a hug, whatever it may be, and return to your seats via the center aisle. In the back, we're going to go in the reverse. We're going to peel off, go out, meet, and come down. If you're in the balcony, I still don't know how it happens, but y'all make it work. Come on up, y'all.
Did you feel the mountains tremble? Did you hear the ocean roar? When the people rose to sing of Jesus Christ the risen brokenness is washed away by God's love. And brothers and sisters, that is not a story that we can keep to ourselves. That is one that we must, we must share with our kids. They've got to know the hope and the joy that carries on our days. They've got to know God's love. So go out and pass it on. Pass it on to them in all that you do. I pray this, for they did not see. Go and show them. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Lord, you're leading me, Lord, you're leading me with the cloud by day, with the cloud by day. 